like climate change. Uh, the, the sea, the ocean seemed enormously too great to be damaged by our actions and so forth. And uh, so it was just theoretical. Now it's not theoretical anymore. You, there have been dozens of scientific studies which show that we are either at or past crucial limits. We hear every day what's happening with climate change uh, and not happening with the climate change conventions. Uh, and we start to see the consequences of these actions. Recently in Australia, the National Institute there, CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organization. It's a huge set of research centers in different cities of Australia. Uh, did a study. One of the scientists there gathered data on global development for major variables over the period from 1972 up to 2000, so 30 years. And then he did his best to plot that on or compare it with our two different runs, uh, an overshoot run and a sustainable development run. And this is the results. There are four variables, population, industrial output, non-renewable resources, and persistent pollution. And for each of them, two curves, the green curve, which is just taken from our computer scenario overshoot, and the blue curve, which is taken from our one of our computer scenarios, sustainable development, and the purple dots are historical data. Doesn't prove anything, but what it shows is that so far as we can tell, we are still moving on a path which is consistent with overshoot. And then uh, last year, they did the study again, adding another 10 years of data, and reached the same conclusion. As a scientist, I can tell you that I don't start to be really excited about this until they, we see the turning points starting to show up in the data. It's relatively easy to fit a exponential growth curve. But nonetheless, the data don't give much support for the idea that we're moving towards a sustainable future. And you can see that in other ways. Uh, for example, there's an institute in Belgium which gathers data on natural disasters. I'm not sure why you would want to spend your time doing that, but that's what they do. And from 1900 up to 2010, this shows the empirical data that they have discovered. And it's not a temporary matter. If we look ahead, we can expect that the process is only going to become more intense and more severe. For example, there's a lot of talk now about climate change. We've experienced globally something like a 0 0.7 degree, 0 0.7 degree rise. The goal was two degrees. And it's now clear that that's totally out of the question. There's no way that we would be able to stop the system with only two. It's going to be more than that, maybe much more. And what does that mean? Well, it means that if we stopped today putting out greenhouse gases, still there is already enough in the atmosphere to produce change for centuries. What does that mean? Well, it's not known for sure. It's very difficult to make these calculations. But the IPCC, the International uh, Program on Climate Change with scientists around the world, has been trying to understand what lies ahead. Uh, Recently, I was in Moscow. I was trying to persuade some senior Russians that they ought to start taking climate change seriously. Of course, I'm not even able to persuade Americans to take climate change seriously. So for sure, I didn't have any success in Russia. This is what we can expect. This is a portrait of the globe uh, projected by computer just 20 years from now, showing expected precipitation patterns. Now, as the globe gets warmer, 
the total precipitation actually goes up because more water evaporates from the sea. It has to come down someplace in the form of snow or rain. So it, precipitation totally goes up. But we see that the extremes become much greater. Some areas become much more dry. Others become much more wet. Uh, and the wet areas are likely to experience the precipitation in sudden bursts instead of gradually over time. Anyway, the areas of concern when I was in Moscow were the ones that are red and black. They're the ones where precipitation is going to go down. Agriculture is going to become very, very much more difficult. And I pointed out that this region in China currently grows about 65% of the grain of China. So I said to the Russians, you know, you better you got two choices. You can either start to think about climate change or you can start to learn Chinese. <laughs> because just north of this region, it looks pretty green. That's Siberia. The Russians think that they own it. But in fact, already many Chinese are moving up into this region. And then I just, by accident, I looked over here and I said, oh, actually, I better start learning Spanish. <laughs> because most of Mexico is going to become extremely difficult. How will that unfold? Well, I don't, I don't know, but uh, we're going to get a taste of it because just now there's a very serious drought in the United States, which is still getting worse. We quit thinking about it because of Sandy, but actually the drought's getting worse. It's in the main agricultural region of the United States. Your food prices will be higher next summer because of that drought. And in the poor countries where already 40, 50, 60 percent of their income is spent on food, you will again have a wave of civil unrest analogous to what we saw across North Africa recently. Uh, it's quite clear that that wave of unrest had, was importantly influenced by uh, rising food prices. So we need to expect that more is coming. And indeed, even the very conservative American financial newspaper, Wall Street Journal, had uh, two weeks ago, just before I came over here, a front page article, Volatility, about how things are going to become much more uh, chaotic. So we are in a new period now. Unfortunately, we keep the same old goals as a basis for our action. The same old goal in this case is sustainable development. This term has a very long history, but it was given widespread use by the Brundtland Commission. This report uh, led by a really remarkable Norwegian woman who talked to the United Nations about uh, long-term futures. And in her report is, or in that report with her name, is this term. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I've always thought this is an absolutely fabulous political definition. It tells the politicians that they can promise everything to you and they don't have to worry about the people in the future because they're going to meet their needs also because we're going to do sustainable development. It's a fantasy. The definition was useful in the sense that it did start to show that there is some connection between the present generation and the future, but it pretended that we could worry about the present without having to think so much about the future. That's a hope. There's no scientific foundation for thinking that. It's politically convenient. If that definition weren't bad enough, we have started to impute or to assume uh, additional things about this magical process of sustainable development. And now when you hear Merkel or Obama or others uh, talking about sustainable development, they actually are implying some additional uh, ideas. Uh, first, that as sustainable development takes place, certainly the rich, that means us, uh, can keep what we have. You know, nobody who talks about sustainable development is telling you that you're going to have to give up something, typically. Not very much, anyway. But, of course, 
while we keep what we have and maybe even get a little bit more, certainly it's fair that the poor come up. So that's also implied that somehow the third world, less affluent, less rich areas were going to get up to our standard. And uh, this is all going to happen inside our current system. We won't have to make really big changes in our government, in our economics, uh, or other aspects uh, of our society. How is this going to happen? Well, that's another idea about sustainable development. Uh, we're going to decouple the use of energy and materials from the expansion of material output. So GDP will start going up while all the things that damage the environment start going down. This is called decoupling, and the notion that one can go up while the other goes down is called absolute decoupling. There's absolutely no empirical evidence to imagine that that's possible. And indeed, quite a lot of experience suggests it is not possible. We have achieved relative decoupling, where GDP goes up and other things go up slower. But this idea that one goes up and the other down is absolutely no foundation for that. And of course, how are we going to achieve this? With growth, which will give us more resources for all of these things. Of course, growth didn't solve these problems over the last 50 years, but now suddenly it's going to start solving these problems for us. And we bring to this old goal also the same old mechanisms. I, just before it came over, I read once again that Merkel and the French are running off to meet, actually in Berlin, as you see, in order to figure out how to stimulate growth so that you'll have more resources to deal with the Greek debt crisis and the unemployment in Spain and so forth. This isn't going to work. It, it isn't working, and it isn't going to work. It reminds me of the lady I saw recently in a foreign country. She was speaking English to somebody who didn't understand English. And so when it became clear that that person didn't understand what she was saying, she just spoke louder. <laughs> we need to do something very different. Otherwise, we're confronting this situation. This con concept of sustainable capacity of the planet is a very difficult one. It has all sorts of issues related to data and ethics and assumptions about uh, political and technical change and so forth. Nonetheless, we can't escape the question, how many people can we support? Very interesting question. How many can you support in Munich? Uh, uh, this curve doesn't talk about that, but I think a counterpart of this curve has been developed from Munich. The idea here is that you convert all of the non-renewable resources, so copper and tin and oil and so forth, into their renewable equivalents. Because for the first 200,000 years of our history in this planet, we only could use renewable resources. And after another century or so, the re non-renewables, which currently generate so much wealth, will be essentially gone, no longer useful to us anyway, and then we'll be back using renewable resources again. Of course, with more sophisticated technology and a better understanding, so it won't be like turning the clock back, but nonetheless, we will have to go back to living on what the Earth provides. There was a brief period when we thought we would start bringing stuff in from the moon and from asteroids, but now basically people don't talk about that anymore, and they say you know, it is really what's on the Earth. Wackernagel, uh, in his analysis, talks about a global ecological impact of one. That's where you're using just as much as the Earth can sustainably regenerate. Back in 1972, when we did our first book, we were globally at about 0.85 or 9, something like that. We weren't using all of the Earth's 
sources, and therefore it was theoretically possible to imagine slowing down. We didn't. Now we're out here uh, at about 1.6, and actually it's accelerating. Now slowing down isn't going to be possible. We have to get back down. We have to bring ourselves back down under this line. Wackernagel is very optimistic. He assumes that when you go over the carrying capacity, you don't damage it. Any ecologist knows that's not true. This curve, this line probably is actually going down now. But leave that aside. Wherever it is, it's under our current use, and we need to come down. We can do that in two ways. We can realistically understand our options and start doing things now to bring us back down, or we can keep pretending that we don't have to, and then we'll still come down, but it will be through forces that we don't pick. You know, it's like a car driving fast inside a factory building. It's gonna stop one way or another, either because the person puts on the brakes or because it runs into the wall, but one way or the other, a car is not going to go past the limits, and neither are we. So what can we do? Well, I mentioned some ideas. Focus on universal rather than global problems. Look at cultural and social change <coughs> instead of owning technology. Focus on making things more resilient and shifting over to action. So let me talk about these quickly. Focusing on universal problems. There are many problems that affect all people in the world. I like to divide them into two categories, global problems and universal problems. Both categories affect everybody, but for the global problems, it requires that everybody take action in order to solve the problem. So climate change is a global problem. There's no way that people in Hanover can solve climate change unless also the people in Beijing, Washington, uh, Moscow, and Rio de Janeiro, and everywhere else also uh, do something. Universal problems affect everybody, but they can be solved locally. Everybody's affected by urban air pollution, but you can actually clean up the air here in Hanover without waiting for Beijing and Mexico City to do the same thing. Eventually, we're going to have to deal with both. But initially, we should focus on the universal problems. They have the attribute that if you pay here now, you get benefits here soon. Some politicians can actually get excited about that. Global problems have the attribute that you pay here and now, and somebody over there much later gets the benefits. I don't find many politicians who try to win re-election by promising you that they're going to do that for you. So we need, first of all, to focus on the universal problems. Let me just give a quick example. The good news is that the population growth rates in most EU countries are going down. This shows uh, a number of them, France, United Kingdom, and so forth. You see around about 2000, uh, the gr growth rates start to be negative. That's good. I mean, if sustainable development is anything, it, it means a stable population. We should be very happy about that. The problem is that if your population goes down, your labor force goes down, actually even faster than the decline in population. Here's some projections for Germany made by the German uh, Statistical Office. And this is with no migration. This is where you are permitting uh, 100, 200, or 300,000 people a year to uh, come into the country. But notice, even massive migration doesn't solve the problem. You still have a declining workforce. When you have a declining workforce, you have a declining GNP. There is, this has been thought about, especially in Japan, which is ahead of you in some ways on this issue, and just buying a lot of robots is not going to somehow compensate for the fact that your labor force goes down. Actually, this strikes terror into the heart of most policymakers, and that's why you hear 
corporate leaders talking about subsidizing women to have more babies and opening up the borders to uh, in-migration and so forth. But if we treat this as a universal problem that needs to be dealt with in a rational way, we have other alternatives. Um, take Germany, for example. This shows what's happened to the German GDP from 1970 up to the current. F fabulous growth, uh, really uh, amazing. Uh, so what's happened to German happiness during this time? More difficult to say, but insofar as we can gather data about it, it's been going down. So you would think that simply telling someone that you need to start anticipating a situation where your workforce, therefore your GDP will be going down, wouldn't necessarily be uh, a terrible and terrifying statement, but so far we haven't uh, understood that. We need to focus on cultural and social changes. I give you a quick example here. I, we have a large group of people in the audience who are working on energy use in cities. So I took an energy example. I could use climate or spread of nuclear weapons. I could take many, many different examples, but I'll use energy here. This is the global, uh, this is the global energy system. And you see oil is about 34% of the total. All those windmills that uh, you are justifiably proud of are here in this little slice, and that's here. Most of the renewables so far is just wood burning, which we've, of course, been doing for centuries. Um, that's gas, that's coal. The thing about oil is that although it's only 34% of the total, it's extraordinarily important in transport, in medicines, in uh, the production of agricultural chemicals, and so there's several sectors of absolutely crucial where oil is very difficult uh, to substitute. So it's interesting to us to know what's happening with oil. And what's happening is that since 1984, so uh, what is that, that's uh, 28 years, since 1984, every year the globe has used more oil than it discovered. We're drawing down those massive oil deposits that we found back in the 50s and the 60s in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Middle, mainly in the Middle East, uh, and so forth. We know from other examples that you can draw down for about 20, 25, 30 years, and then uh, your use has to start declining. And we are now in a period of history where global oil production has basically reached its maximum, and it's about to start going down. You can see this in the, state, in the statistics. Uh, from 95 to 99, oil production increased almost 6%. The next five years, almost 8% globally. Then from 05 to 09, 4%. And the best estimate I've seen is one done by a German think tank, the World uh, the Energy Watch Group, which says that by 2030, oil will be half of current levels. So we, we need to do something about it. Here's where we can start to think about cultural effects. What causes oil consumption? Well, it's a factor of four variables. Number of people, capital, energy per unit of capital, and the fraction of that energy which comes from fossil fuels. This is really standard of living. It's the amount of capital, house, car, clothing, auditoriums, so forth that you have. These are social factors, these are technical factors. If you think about what Germany's been doing, and the United States and other countries, we've been working very hard to reduce the fraction of energy from fossil fuels. That's by increasing renewables. Germany's been one of the leaders in that field. We're working on energy efficiency, passive houses, Prius automobiles, so forth. But we basically ignore population growth saying it's politically incorrect to think about that. And it's an item of faith that the living standard has to stay where it is or even go up. And so we're in a situation where there's growth here, which we ignore, and we're desperately trying over here to reduce things, and our results don't offset. And so fossil fuel use in the past has gone up. Now it's gonna go down. 
And the question is, which of these is going to adjust? If we don't start to focus on these factors, then they will force us through ways that we don't like very much uh, to go down. We have to make the systems more resilient. Resilience is designing your systems so that they continue to function in the presence of shocks. New York City wasn't very resilient, at least the subway system, uh, when Sandy came. Uh, we need to redesign things. And now, of course, they're working very hard in New York to do that. People had told them for decades that they were vulnerable to this kind of storm surge, but they didn't pay attention. Now, now they pay attention. This actually has a strong use. It means at the personal level, if you make your house more resilient, you and your family will not be so disturbed by the kinds of shocks that are coming. At the national level, it really, by seeking resilience, we're trying to protect our democratic institutions because if we don't make things resilient and chaos comes, there's going to absolutely, as there always has been in the past, be a drift off towards authoritarian systems. There's always some jerk who's willing to stand up and say, you know, change your constitution. It's happening in Egypt right now, actually. Change your constitution, give me authority, and I will make sure that the trains run on time and the streets are peaceful and so forth. And if we can build resilience into the system, that jerk is simply not going to be very appealing. I give you a vocabulary for resilience. I won't go into it now. It's actually kind of boring. Uh, but the key thing is that there's a systematic effort to increase the efficiency of systems, the, the profitability of corporate enterprises, the amount of a political project which manifests between now and the next election, and so forth. And those policies tend to reduce the resilience of the system. So we've pushed things far out here uh, with uh, in industry, for example, just-in-time manufacturing, which meant that all the key parts we needed was manufactured in one super efficient factory, which unfortunately happened to be in Fukushima. And when it was destroyed, suddenly all factories around the world producing those things didn't have the parts they needed. Or in Thailand, uh, we had a super efficient hard drive uh, factory, which got inundated by the floods. And suddenly, all around the world, people couldn't make all the computers they wanted. They, we had lost the resilience. Now they're moving back. And so that brings me actually to the last uh, item, which is we need to start thinking how to take action. And of course, I have found another game to illustrate something about that. This is actually important. And if you don't remember anything else I said tonight, I hope you remember the main point uh, of this exercise. In just a moment, I'm going to ask all of you in the room to clap your hands. Let me say, this is not a sneaky way to get applause. <laughs> this has a serious purpose. I'll make it very simple for you. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Then I'll say, clap. Don't, don't do it. And exactly when I say th that word, everybody will do it. And if we're successful, you know, somebody outside will just hear one very loud, quick noise. So I'm going to count to three, then I'll say clap, and exactly when I say clap, you all do it. And then we'll see. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, clap. <laughs> 